as soon as we achieve quorum, we will begin. Thank you for your patience. Welcome to the regularly scheduled meeting of the Business Inspections, Housing, and Zoning Committee for today, which is November 28th. I've been joined by a quorum of the committee, including Council Members Ellison, Osman, Rainville, and Chavez, myself, Council Member Goodman, as chair. Um, we have a fire code requirement that everyone be seated in a seat, but I think since we have a consent agenda, we'll move first. That might allow us to clear out the room a little bit, so there's no reason for everyone to leave and come back. Let's see how we shake out after the consent agenda. So I'm going to go ahead and move the consent agenda, which includes item number 14, the liquor license approvals, and 15, the liquor license renewals. Item 16 are the gambling license approvals. 17 are the spring 2023 Brownfield grants to the Metropolitan Council in Hennepin County. Item number 18 is grant applications for employment and training services for adults. Item 19 is the Workforce Board grant. Item 20 is approving a legislative directive regarding labor standards. Item 21 is a deadline extension for a forgivable loan to the Indigenous Peoples Task Force. Item number 22 is a legislative directive regarding a comparative analysis of TNC minimum compensation models. Item 23 is the Minneapolis Committee on Housing Appointments. Item 24 is the Minneapolis Public Housing Authority appointments. With that, I'm going to move all of those items and add item number 29, which is the rezoning on Van Buren. Uh, we're going to move that back to staff. Are there any items anyone would like to pull on the consent agenda? Council Member Rainville. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I just wanted a brief comment on item number 10 on the new liquor license. Is there anybody here from Dario? Yeah, no, we're on the consent agenda. Items 14 through 20 floor, including item 29. We're not on the public hearing agenda. Yet. No, no, I'm, I'm uh, so on the consent item 14, number 10. I see. Is there anyone here from Dario? No? Okay. Thank you. Do you want to pull that? No. I'm okay. Fine. Okay. Further comments or questions on the consent agenda items 14 through 24 and item 29 being referred back to staff? Comments or questions? Seeing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Those items are approved. Now we'll see who gets up and we will see what seats are available, and everyone who's standing will have to go into the overflow room if there is not a seat available. Is there anyone in a seat for any consent agenda items? Okay, we'll have to have the, uh, everyone who's standing will need you to go into the uh, overflow room, please, and we'll start with item number one and work our way through the public hearing items, and we'll ask folks, are all the people in the seats here for items on the public hearing agenda? If you're not here for one of the public hearing items, but you're here for one of the um, discussion items, I would ask you kindly to go into the overflow room so the people who are here for the public hearing items can have a place to sit. Let's see if that does a shuffle. Okay. We'll be right with you, Mr. Hansen. I assure you all that the security will let people know when there's empty seats and we can move people into empty seats. Everyone who's standing needs to take a seat now. Everyone. 
Are you security? Except for the security. Thank you for being here. <laughs> Great. We'll start with item number one, which is Mayor Fry's nomination of Eric Hansen to serve in the position of the Director of Community Planning and Economic Development. I'm going to first turn it over to the mayor, who has joined us to introduce this item. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, members of the City Council, uh, for hearing this nomination today. I am beyond proud uh, to put forward the name of Eric Hansen to be the permanent director of CPED. He's been operating in the role as interim uh, since around June uh, and has managed just in that short time to pull a whole lot of work and people together to do some really extraordinary things. Uh, one of the things that has always frustrated me about the city in general is that we do a lot of good work and aren't so good at explaining what we've done. Uh, and Eric has found new and really innovative ways to get out the word about the ownership and opportunity fund, something that several council members have, have had a, a great hand in supporting, uh, bringing millions and millions of dollars through to ensure that communities of color don't just have a business ownership, but also have ownership over the property. This is an idea that Eric spearheaded from the very beginning. Uh, something else that I think has really struck me in, my, uh, in, in, in this decision to nominate him uh, is his willingness to dive into very controversial issues that are tough. Um, CPED is an organization that does really positive work. For the most part, CPED is an entity that is on the offense. Uh, an entity, there are many other departments at the city that I won't get into that are often uh, on the defense. Uh, and so it would be very easy just to put forward a bunch of stuff that everyone supports. Uh, however, Eric has found ways to bring people together around some of those very controversial issues, very large scale projects like Upper Harbor Terminal uh, that are multi-year uh, in many cases, multi-administration projects where it's one team handing off the baton to another. And Eric has been kind of the glue that has bound all of that together. Uh, I've seen him work uh, through some of those difficult issues like Upper Harbor, Upper Harbor Terminal, and he does so uh, by building out relationships in areas that you wouldn't uh, necessarily anticipate. Um, he started with a deep root uh, in the city of Minneapolis, uh, lived on the north side, uh, got a job in, I can't remember, Brooklyn Park or Brooklyn Center? Park. Brooklyn Park. Uh, uh, to run their economic development there. And, th and then he came back to the city because this is truly where he wants to be. This is where his passion lies. Uh, and, you know, I, my selection of Eric is not just because of, of Eric and his talents and skills, which are many. It's also because of the incredible team that we have right now in CPED. This is a group of people, whether around housing or economic development or business licensing, uh, zoning, uh, that consistently outperforms nearly every city in the entire country. When I go around and I talk to mayors throughout the rest of the country, one of the first things that they bring up to me is the work that is happening that is being led by CPED. Some of that is in the housing area. Some of that is around the comprehensive plan. And some of it is around these really innovative projects that we've worked on to push back on some of the very intentional segregation and the really hard practices from the past uh, into a very bright future. Eric's been at the forefront of, of that work. He's been at the helm. Uh, I, I ask for your support humbly, uh, and uh, Mr. Hansen, thank you so much for being willing to take on this job. We believe in you. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so this is a public hearing. So do you want to speak before the public hearing or after the public hearing? It's your pleasure. When I you think you it? should speak after. Okay. Just then you get the last word, right. which is probably better. <laughs> That will be the only time you probably get the last word in this job. <laughs> um, <laughs> this will be going forward, right? Um, we're here today to consider the mayor's recommendation of Eric Hansen to be the director of the Community Planning and Economic Development Division. There are six people signed up uh, to speak. Um, we will take you in the order that you signed up and invite you to speak for two minutes. Uh, we'll start with Ave. Uh, Abe, and then KB, Brandon, Jamie, Shannon, and Maggie in that order. And we'd welcome the first person to step forward. Hi, my name is uh, Abe Demach, 
and I uh, just prepared little notes <clears throat> short uh, for Eric. Today I'm here to express my uh, strong support for Mr. Hansen to be nominated for director of a CPED. I've lived in uh, Minneapolis nearly over three decades and I've witnessed transformation impact of this leadership in our community, especially in a vibrant and diverse Lake Street area, which is the hub of a BIPAC community. During the pandemic and subsequent of civil unrest, it was turbulent and a dark time for all of us. The only part of the town that remained resilient was Lake Street and testament of the strengths and diversity of people, Europeans to Latinos, Latinos to Africans, and many other immigrants' uh, families who have owned businesses here for generations, found a beacon of uh, hope in Mr. Hansen's uh, efforts. He was an instrumental in securing an emergency relief funds and implementing efficient recovery methods, providing crucial assistance for small businesses and BIPAC developers. Mr. Hansen's dedication shows brightly uh, uh, during the 2020 uh, testimony of the state capital delivered via Zoom, soon to be a disturbance at a time when many of us have lost uh, faith in our leadership. He stood as a sincere and caring uh, leader, advocating for uh, reconstruction of our community, and his beacon extended beyond business interests to human needs of all the neighborhood. I was particularly moved by his commitment as he attended every meetings and activities, particularly discussion, despite having personally lost properties in the chaos. His words and testim uh, his word to the state's official were very powerful, emphasizing the needs of rebuilding and preventing gentrification, not only on Lake Street, North Minneapolis, and St. Paul. Thank Ms. you. Unfortunately, your two minutes is all right. Thank you for Thank your you testimony all. and for being here today. The next speaker, KB Brown followed by Brandon. Are you Mr. Brown? Yes, ma'am. Welcome, sir. Hello. Um, keep this short and simple. Um, our city deserves to have someone who cares about the community, um, especially North Minneapolis, for all, but someone who cares about the community and all of its citizens and will do what's best for us, and that's Eric Hansen. That's Thank it. you for your testimony and for being here today. Brandon, followed by J Jamil Ford. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. I'm Brandon Champo, Senior Vice President and Market Leader for United Properties. And I'm here to express my support uh, for Eric Hansen to this role. I'm probably going to repeat a few of the things that Mayor Fry said, but I've, I've worked closely with Eric since his days at Brooklyn Park whether it was on development agreements for headquarter projects or design requirements or navigating community process at Upper Harbor. Uh, I've found Eric to be somebody that I think will set the right tone and will deliver the kind of results that uh, this department needs. Uh, I think the, main, the four main qualities I would say about Eric, he's authentic, uh, you know what you're getting with him. He'll, be, uh, he'll listen, but he'll be blunt and kind of tell you where things stand. I think that he is a very balanced and collaborative uh, leader. He understands, I think, thinks civic need first, but uh, also understands that uh, we have to find um, optimal paths that, um, that satisfy both the public and the private sector. Uh, he's a deal maker. I think he's a very thoughtful negotiator. He'll listen, but uh, will also... Uh, take the steps necessary to, to try to find a, a path forward. And then I think the last thing is he's enduring. Mayor Fry mentioned this. Um, I've sat through over 100 community meetings in Upper Harbor with Eric. He shows up every time. He's not afraid to make a decision. He's not afraid to take the criticism that comes with making that decision. And I think that uh, these are qualities that this department needs to be successful. And I uh, wholeheartedly urge you to uh, support the nomination. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, Jamil, followed by Shannon Fitzgerald. Good morning, Mr. Ford. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, uh, council members. Um, I'm here on the behalf of Mr. Bill English, and uh, he sends his regards. Uh, I want to just go ahead and read what I was been told to read. Uh, 
Good afternoon, members of the council. I would be lying if I said I would be here to speak in person today. The fact is that I have been in Phoenix since Thanksgiving and enjoying warm, southern, uh, warm sunny weather. I know most of you would change place with me today. The bad news is I'm coming home tomorrow. <laughs> I have a mentee and a colleague to read this statement on my behalf. I appreciate extending my, my, uh, this opportunity to address you this way. Over the past eight years, I have had the opportunity to work with several CPED directors. Each of them has been helpful and made substantial contributions to the city. However, one stands out in my opinion, and in the words of Tina Turner, Eric is simply the best, and the best is and better than all the rest. Um, I have watched Eric from being a contributor to becoming a mature leader. During the planning for the Upper Harbor Terminal project, Eric has demonstrated considerable, considerable patience in the processes. And while listening to the participants, he also suggested ideals that seem to be uh, satisfactory uh, to the body of the individuals with different opinions and perspectives. Throughout that long process, Eric was consistent in focusing this project on the most underinvested community in Minneapolis. He used his leadership skills to guide the task group without being overbearing and exerting any power. I have come to respect Eric as a person with considerably uh, integrity and soft-spoken, but fiercely loyal to what has been perceived as the city's values. I urge you, City Council, to approve the mayor's nomination as CPRED director. I will give him my full, full support and thank you again for the opportunity to, to address you in this manner. Respectfully, Bill English. Thank you. If, if he was here, he would take two more minutes, but thanks a lot. <laughs> we, we really appreciate you, Eric. Thanks. Thank you. Um, Shannon Fitzgerald, followed by Maggie Strom. Welcome. Good afternoon, great to see all of you this afternoon. Uh, thank you for giving me a moment to speak on behalf of Eric Hansen. I uh, strongly support his, uh, his <laughs> nomination, thank you. See, this is the first time I've done this, so I'm a little bit nervous. Nomination as CPED director. Um, I'm Shannon Fitzgerald, I'm the director of Downtown Partnerships for the Minneapolis Downtown Council, as well as being the executive director for New Loop Partners and the executive director for East Town Business Partnership. Uh, all of that work gives me a number of different projects that I work on that all have involved Eric at some point or another. Um, but the first time I met Eric, I had not started any of these jobs yet, and uh, I was introduced to him by a colleague. And I was just curious about what was happening in Minneapolis and what was happening with the economics in Minneapolis, what was happening with the choices that were being made by the city. And he sat down with me, he, will, he gave me a 30 minute coffee and it turned into an hour and a half long conversation where he was very open, very honest, very sincere, very authentic about the work that was being done in Minneapolis to somebody who was just asking questions. And I will be very grateful to him for that, but I, what I see past that is that he shows up to every Everything. I have run into this man in the craziest places, and I see the relationships that he's built in this city, and I see the work that he's done to be able to hear and listen and understand the various communities, the different things that are going on, and to know who the, the players are and who the leaders are and who the people are that need to be heard and haven't been heard, and he's there. He's there to hear them. He's there to understand them, and for that reason, Outside of all of the other things that the folks who've had more experience with Eric in, in the economic development area have known, what I know is that he is great for this position because he's a listener and an understander and wanting to be there for this community. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you. I'm Maggie Strom, followed by Kristen Crabtree. Ms. Strom? Excuse me. Um Chair Goodman, I believe Maggie Strom signed up incorrectly and intended to speak on something else. Okay, well, she can still speak on her thing. We'll move on to Christine Crabtree, followed by Nicole Mason. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Welcome. Good afternoon, Chair Goodman, committee. Um, my name is Kristen Crabtree. I live in Ward 9. Um, I'm here on behalf of Camp Nanakasi just to speak. Um, I know that 
Eric Hansen has been out to visit us, and I just wanted to encourage you, if you could speak a little bit today or guarantee that you will consider public health when there are people on public land. We've been at the camp for 102 days working on porta potties, and we understand they may come tomorrow, but we will be here until they actually do, because public health for our full community matters. You know, it's not just the residents living in the camp, but also the people living around the camp. This is basic human dignity and human rights. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we'll have Nicole Mason followed by Tonda Bluebear. Are either of Nicole or Tonda here? You're welcome to speak now to the nomination of Eric Hansen. You have two minutes, ma'am. Welcome. Thank you. Um, Eric? Hey, Eric. <laughs> nice to meet you. So I'm Nicole uh, Mason. I am the organizer of Nenokasi Healing Camp here in South Minneapolis on 23rd Street and 13th Avenue. We have approximately 200 homeless relatives there, which approximately 186 are indigenous. Um, I am here to ask you um, what your plan would be for having 102 days that I've been following the relatives and we still have no porta potties. We have elders, we have people that have health conditions. Is it um, because, you know, I don't, I don't understand. I don't understand because it's inhumane. We've been asking and asking and sending emails. I, I really want a clear answer. What would be your solution Ms. Moan, this for is the people that are there? They, we have had zero overdose by deaths. And all we're asking is for porta potties while we work with county agencies, while we work with Avivo, while we work with Helix, to get the houseless relatives into treatment and into housing. It's inhumane that we are using, and along myself with them, day and night using bags to, you, to go to the bathroom in. At this point, it's cold where they're freezing. Okay? Imagine that. That's all we're asking is for the human decency for porta potties and for the right to be there until a small amount of people are there so we can get people housed and no longer in the street. It's not much that we're asking. We're not asking to keep people in the encampment for a lifetime or a, a lifetime long encampment. We just don't wanna see the people pushed around and we wanna see them housed. And keeping them in one spot for a gifted amount of time is the solution. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. And Tanda Bluebear. Good afternoon. Thank you for being here. Hello. My name is Tanda Blue Bear. Um, I heard a woman when I was standing in the hall say that you want to listen and you want to understand. You can listen, but to truly understand, you must get out of those penny loafers, come out of this building, and go meet the people that you govern. The unhoused relatives in every state, in every city, are the invisible people. The ones that you govern, that are governing do not listen to. Most of you that govern probably don't even know anybody who's unhoused yet. You guys are the ones that are making the decision for what is best for people that you don't know. When Nicole's speaking, and when we're talking about elections of new people, and you really want to understand you got to get into your tennis shoes. You got to answer emails, set up appointments, and actually come down to the camp. The unhealth crisis that is in this whole country is completely solvable. But you at the top aren't going to solve it unless you work with us that are on the ground working with those who are experiencing poverty, um, homelessness. You have to come down. You have to humble yourselves. You have to come down and listen. I know you may not want to listen to us that are on the ground, but we know the people. We know the needs, and I'm telling you right now. I, w I was in California. We have the first self-governed encampment in the entire nation. This is solvable. 
but you're going to have to come down here and you're going to have to talk to people like Nicole Mason, who's been there for over 100, and 100 days, nonstop, day in and day out, 16 hours a day with these people through the heat, through the cold. When was the last time any of you did anything you weren't paid for? Thank for, you for anybody your other than whoever's giving you that paycheck. I just want you to think of that. So as you run, if you want to know the people, you need to be on the ground with the people. Thank you Thank for you. your testimony. That concludes our list for our public hearing. I'll see if there's anyone left who would like to say something about the nomination of Eric Hansen. Seeing none, I'm going to close the public hearing and offer Mr. Hansen the opportunity to speak to his nomination. Thank you. Good afternoon, Madam, good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the committee. My name is Eric Hansen, and I stand in front of you today filled with optimism of possibility. Same optimism of possibility I felt on a frigid January day almost 21 years ago when I first walked into the Crown Roller Mill to take my first job as a project coordinator for the Minneapolis Community Development Agency. In those early, year, in those early days of 2003, I walked in expecting a two-year at most postgraduate school position where I'd learn a few things, meet a few people, and be on my way. Rather than be on my way, I would soon realize the possibilities of joining a team with over 150 years of combined community development experience, who I would learn quickly had a willingness to teach me this noble profession. For the next 12 years, I had the most incredible, incredible formative experience in the MCDA soon becoming the Department of CPED where my educational base in economics and public policy translated into a strategic and tactical community development skill set on how to get programs enacted, how to get projects completed through a complex system that balances both market, need, market requirements, community expectations, and political realities. It was during this period I learned performance, services and uses, underwriting deal structures, negotiating government regulations and processes and procedures in this complex system. To be an effective community development professional, it became clear to me in those early years, it really serves to be in an apprentice role. And to start um, in the, uh, to learn this profession from everybody else on the team, and that's regardless of their position in the organizational chart. Being here today is because I, I, of the imparted wisdom I received from directors, deputy directors and managers, and attorneys and accountants and committee clerks and colleagues across the city enterprise. A key lesson during this apprenticeship phase emphasized by each of my mentors is that the most in, important aspect of community development is knowing how programs, projects, and investments affect people. The base of our work is community. You could say that's, that's CPED's first name for a reason. Prior to joining the, the city, I began my career as a community organizer in Minneapolis neighborhoods and understand the importance of community agency and decision making. Engagement was an expressed expectation on, to be on the CPED team with encouragement to innovate and expand the voice of the people in the process. Effective community engagement comes when you're willing to live outside your comfort zone. Effective community engagement identifies and raises up the perspectives of those impacted the most by the decisions, especially those who have been historically marginalized by our system. A system that was developed through intentional public sector and private market decisions that advantaged some over others, mainly along gender normative and racialized lines. As a consequence, there is a wealth disparity in Minneapolis that impacts people's root emotional, social emotional well-being and, and detrimental impacts on families' ability to fully participate in our economy. I'm a cis white male. I recognize that this system was built to benefit people like me. If we are to eliminate the disparities bred in the system, I have the responsibilities to change it and to ensure that I partner with those marginalized communities during this change. I acknowledge my responsibilities to work to remove existing barriers to wealth building and my ro role in ensuring that CPED continues to build participatory systems that enhance intentional and inclusive decision-making processes. I come by this perspective in large part due to my own community partnership experience. I praise the coaching and friendship I've received in community over these past two decades. 
One of the most impactful experiences in my career started in 2005 when I was assigned to be the project manager of four commercial projects on the North Side. The North Side community provides, provided an important mentorship in early in my career, just as important as I learned from city staff. My connections at the time were not strong on the North Side, even though I had moved to the Victory neighborhood a few years prior. My task was to complete for development projects as soon as possible and then be on my way. Each site had been dormant or vacant for many years with little market interest and few economic tools available. At the beginning of this process, community leaders were incredibly gracious and generous with me, open to working on these projects, but with some conditions. These conditions included straight talk from me and an expectation that I'd be an impeccable in my word. They expected a seat at the decision-making table and that all projects would benefit the existing community. Over the next few years, we did, a gr we did great work in repositioning these developments into active buildings of coffee shops and credit unions and a grocery store. But more importantly, we built lasting partnerships with community leaders, small business owners, developers, and lenders that help me today across this city. The practices I learned during this period is the basis of my engagement philosophy today, acknowledging that community, the community we need to serve and look for ways to increase their voices in this process. As a result, our plans have stronger community benefits, identified people impacted most, see the Upper Harbor Coordinated Plan and the planning processes underway at Kmart and the People's Way as examples. My apprenticeship formally ended when I accepted a job in Brooklyn Park as their economic development and housing director. During these three years in Brooklyn Park was my first opportunity to manage professional staff. Our team addressed housing development and ownership programs, neighborhood preservation, workforce development, and economic development activities. This experience was my transition to move from mentee to mentor and pay it forward to a new generation of community development professionals. As soon as I got steady in that role, I couldn't resist the opportunity to return back to Minneapolis to achieve a professional, a professional, a personal professional goal of mine to be the director of economic policy and development. It was an absolute aspiration to someday take that economic development role here in Minneapolis, and I worked hard to achieve that goal because I wanted to position a position of leadership to increase equitable outcomes in our work and continue to build a strong team of practitioners. Over the past five years, I'm proud of the work that we've accomplished, first reviewing each economic development program for intent and effectiveness, then making modifications, and finally leaning into the City Council's strategic racial equity action plan goals for this division. As a result, at least seven out of 10 people in each of our economic development programs are BIPOC individuals, developers, or business owners. We can achieve um, we only can achieve these outcomes because of the city's solid partnerships with our network of community-based providers for whom their work is the linchpin to our collective progress. We also monitor and report out better on our progress with racially disaggregated data, and based on that data, the feedback we receive from participants and our community-based partners, we can continue to identify gaps. We have been nimble as a city to find resources, such as increased funding through the through programs like Ownership and Opportunity Fund, technical assistance through BTAP and DTAP, and increased career pathway programs for job seekers as a result. The adaptiveness of the CPED team has been invaluable since the start of the pandemic in response, and in response to the unrest after the murder of George Floyd. Since 2020, CPED has repurposed almost every program to meet immediate community needs. The department has been working and producing at a high level and I can see that impact more as I assumed the interim director this past summer. We as a department have prioritized the needs of people through the creation of safe, accessible housing programs, better job supports, support for generational wealth building, and making sure that we have a mindfully and safely built city. Much like, our, much like the predecessors who taught me, this current dedicated CPED team will continue to meet the moment in time and have been incredibly creative and productive. We mark our accomplishments in, in, in hundreds, thousands, millions, and billions, and billions in CPED. That's hundreds of housing units produced, thousands of hours of technical assistance to small business, millions of dollars of investment, and billions of dollars of development through our system. 
We are poised to continue this course to meet the, fa the next phase of community need, whether it's the need of raising up cultural districts or reimagining downtown, finding innovative solutions to increase housing access and home ownership, or ensure that we have a bold, forward-looking, inclusive, comprehensive plan. We will continue to work together towards that what is possible. I'm honored to stand in front of you for the consideration of the Director of Community Planning and Economic Development. This is the hard part. I stand here on the shoulders of the MCDA and CPED team who have come before me and were willing to mentor me so, so impactfully that I can realize my professional possibilities. I stand here together with community who guided me through this work, through honesty, frankness, and partnership so that we can realize the possibilities of removing barriers until all people in Minneapolis participate fully in this economy. I stand here alongside the 234 highly trained professionals in CPED who come to work each day in service to the people of Minneapolis so we can realize what is possible for this city. And I stand here humbly as a son, a husband, and a father. I acknowledge my parents for their support raising me, being a role model for hard work, dedicated service, and commitment to family. I acknowledge my wife and two children for their sacrifice of time with me so I can do this work, but I also recognize the joy and love they show me as we continue to build our life together and as we watch our children grow into amazing young people. I admit it has not always been a straight line with me, and I'm a lot to take sometimes, but I love you all for the support you have given me to realize the possibilities in myself. I thank you, Mayor Fry, for this honor of a lifetime, for this nomination, so that I can continue to support the city that I love so dearly. I hope I have your support, Madam Chair, and members of the committee, and I thank you for this time to speak. And with that, I ask if you have any questions. So thank you very much for your comments. I don't know if there are questions as much as comments that folks would like to make. I'll see, are there questions, questions? Okay, so we'll, there's not gonna be a Q&A. Um, the public hearing is closed too, and you don't have to stand there if you don't want to. You could sit in your regular seat right. up here if you want. You. Um, but I, I will first move the uh, nomination uh, for approval today and uh, see if anyone has something they'd like to say. Councilmember Ellison, followed by Councilmember Austin, and then Councilmember Rainville. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, uh, before I go in, uh, just offering some reflections on Eric Hansen, I do want to appreciate, you know, folks are protesting in the hall, and we had some folks give testimony that wasn't necessarily about Eric, but, you know, folks uh, who are, I believe it was the Ninukasi camp are advocating for themselves and I want to I want to make sure that doesn't go unnamed and unacknowledged here in the chamber so just thank them for coming um, and uh, and uh, yeah um, you know uh, I really I want to offer you know hey that was really moving speech Eric thank you I know I don't know how often we get to hear you know what somebody's feeling about the role about their work at that level you know I know that the council chambers is not necessarily always a place for vulnerability but I've really appreciated uh, the way that you've not only the way that you've led, but the way that you stood up here and addressed us and the public today, and I think it's, a, it's an indication of the kind of leader that you are, and so thank you so much for that. Um, you know, it's not every day that we have a, uh, somebody who's nominated that, that uh, evokes the words of Tina Turner, but today we, we had that, and so uh, I would always take that as a, as a positive and as a point in your direction. Um, and, uh, and there's a lot of work to be done, but as you've seen, I, I believe a number of the people who came to give testimony either live in or um, have done work in, or doing work, have projects in North Minneapolis. And so when I think about um, the ways in which I wanna see the most vulnerable communities uh, in our city prioritized, I think that you're someone who has demonstrated a, a track record and a willingness to, to lean into that space, even though the answers aren't always clear, even though, it can be really tough work and really difficult, even though it can be a little thankless. People have been, um, haven't always felt uh, historically like they've been served by the city. Uh, and so sometimes you come in to do good work and uh, the response is still uh, not a kind one. Uh, and I think that, uh, you know, I, we all have a responsibility to be uh, thick skinned, to listen, 
to lean into that feedback uh, and to continue to deliver for folks uh, in the city of Minneapolis. I think that you've done that. I think that you'll continue to do that. And so um, I appreciate it here. And, uh, you know, I hope that uh, I know that I know that, um, you know, not every issue can be solved by one department. Right. Not every uh, um, you know, not every issue can be solved by. Uh, by the amount of money that we allocate towards affordable housing or, or any other project, uh, but we can be strategic and we can be intentional with the way that we do this work. It's great to have a visionary, and I do think you're a visionary as well, but also you got to know the nuts and bolts. How much money are we spending what, on what, when, and to what end? And I think that you've been somebody who's uh, been really dil diligent in those kinds of considerations. So thank you for stepping up. Thank you for accepting the mayor's nomination, and I'm excited to support you today. Councilmember Osman. All right, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, well, thank you, Eric, for your professionalism and understanding uh, some of the complex and challenges uh, that I ask a lot of questions. Um, being a council member, probably Eric is the person I talk to the most in, um, in, in staff. Um, you have been very helpful, kind of making me understand some of uh, how things work and also understand where I'm coming from, that I'm advocating for president that sometimes feel like, you know, they have been left behind. And I represent a ward that is, have a lot of challenges. As you can tell, the folks that came here have uh, been dealing with, uh, uh, you know, homelessness and encampments and different challenges. And I've, you and me spoke about a lot and I know you, uh, you are committed and you have uh, talked to me probably weekly just to update me how things are going in that. And I, um, I think your hard work pays off and you also, your speech and understanding sometimes, you know, um, things might not seem the way they are, but uh, there are backgrounds that are, have been behind and the staff that are working um, very hard. So just wanted to uh, appreciate you really and one last thing I would say is that as a council members, uh, we are advocating for the resident. We just want what's best for our resident. Uh, what is prior to the city is what's prior for our ward. You know, that's, <laughs> that's one of the things we talked about a lot. Um, but I, I look forward working with you and I look forward talking to you weekly. <laughs> and, um, and, you know, um, I think you will do great. Uh, you will do great. and. Um, yeah, thank you so much, and thank you for accepting that, and job, and thank you for leading our city. Councilmember Rainville. Thank you, Madam Chair. Eric, uh, Mr. Hansen, <laughs> I, I will support you on this, and uh, I, first of all, though, I, I just want to thank you. Thank you for being willing to serve. You know, you're going to get attacked. People are going to say really bad things about you. I, I'm glad to hear that you've developed thick skin, because that's kind of a number one <laughs> for, for this job. But I'm, I'm very grateful uh, that you'll take your expertise and your commitment. You know, the mayor has said very uh, kind words about you. We've heard, uh, I was uh, so proud of all the relationships that you have with the different members of the community, the letters of support that were sent in. So I, I do want to let you know that uh, I'm here for you and I'll support you, I'll vote for you, but going forward, I'm here to help you succeed in your job. So thank you so much for serving. Councilmember Chavez. Did Yes, I uh, thank you, Chair Goodman. Uh, before I begin, I just want to thank you for accepting the nomination. I think it's something, uh, an incredible job, an incredible opportunity we have here in the city. Uh, and before I dive deep into my comments, I did want to acknowledge my residents who came and testified today regarding public health measures and encampments. If you could just quickly just respond to that, and then I'll go into my actual comments for the day. Yeah, so the questions about um, having porta potties at the encampment at 23rd and 13th. As you know, the city has a coordinated response to homelessness encampments, and we work closely with the Department of Regulatory Services, and they've been working on contracts for porta potties at that encampment. And I have the director sitting to my left here, so if he needs to put any more detail into it, but as far as he has told me, um, they're working to get those out tomorrow. Uh, thank you so much. And now uh, going back to my actual comments, just want to 
Uh, thank you for your work. I think one of the reasons why I'm very excited to support you is because of your dedication to not only support our city of Minneapolis, but our marginalized communities, folks on West Broadway, folks on Lake Street, folks that oftentimes, like Councilmember Osman said, have felt behind from a multitude of ways. And I know that you are gonna be able to lead this department that already does incredible work into a future that folks in our cultural corridors, folks in downtown, uptown, across the city, are gonna feel like they have a voice in this government. So um, I'm happy to support you. I'm happy about the work that you've been doing for our city. and. Um, hoping to count on you to bring uh, positivity to the city of Minneapolis. Thank you. Seeing no further comments on the chair's motion to approve the nomination by Mayor Fry of Eric Hansen to be the Community Planning and Economic Development Director. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? That item is approved. Thank you for being here today, Mayor. We have a lengthy public hearing agenda, so we are gonna move on to item number two. And, and this will go to the full council for approval on the 7th of uh, December. Uh, we'll move on to item number two, Ms. Deister on uh, McDonald's extended hours license. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Madam Goodman and committee members. I'm lead license inspector Christina Deister from Licenses and Consumer Services. I'm presenting an application from SHSK Incorporated doing business as McDonald's located at 1425 4th Street Southeast. The applicant is requesting an extended hours license for their restaurant. McDonald's has been operating at this location since just last Tuesday, but historically McDonald's has operated at this location prior to the block's reconstruction for many years. Their hours of operation will go to 24 hours a day, seven days a week. They have indoor seating for 100 page patrons. On November 6th, 24 public hearing notices were sent to property owners within 300 feet of the premises. Notices were also sent to the Marcy Homes Neighborhood Association, the Dinky Town Business Alliance, and Council Member Rainville. We have received zero comments from the community. A review of all 311 police calls and operating conditions have, received, have reviewed um, no significant issues regarding this business as they've only been open for one week. The Licenses and Consumer Services Division recommends approval of an extended hours license for McDonald's. This concludes my presentation at this time and I'll stand for any questions or comments you may have. Are there any questions for staff on item number two? Seeing none, uh, we'll open the public hearing. Did you have a question? I'm so sorry. Council Member Anvil. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, Ms. Streeser. Is it, uh, is, is there a safety plan for this? You know, as, as we know, Dinkytown has had a lot of problems uh, with behavior, especially late at night. And ha have you discussed at all with applicant uh, safety? So what happens is the applicant meets with the second precinct and they um, go over a, what's considered a police safety review and it's up to the police department to sign off on the applicant's um, uh, police safety review. In this circumstance, um, they went back and forth and the second precinct did eventually sign off on the police safety review. For the first two months, um, the applicant will only open until midnight. Um, and then after those first two months, the applicant will be allowed um, after approval to be open 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So the police department did take all the precautions and, and that police safety review into consideration. Th thank you for letting me know that. So after the two month uh, closing, do the police weigh in on if they should be allowed those extra hours? I do believe if there's any issues that occur during those first two months. Great, thank you very much. You're thank welcome. you, Madam Chair. This is a public hearing on item number two, which is an extended hours license for McDonald's at 1425 4th Street Southeast. Is there anyone here to speak to this issue? Anyone? Anyone? Hi. Please state your name and address for the record. You have two minutes. Melissa Kennedy, I'm the owner of the McDonald's in Dinkytown. Um, we're very excited to be back. 
Um, it's been a, a really great week. I, I want to address the specific questions regarding safety and security, which is a big concern for ours as well. We have been working closely with campus security as well as the second precinct, uh, a short-term and longer-term plan. Uh, it is actually not our intentions to be open all 24 hours of the day. Um, the previous location was open till 3 a.m. Um, for us, letting people leave, so for the employees to leave at then 4 o'clock, 4.30 in the morning, um, where we can keep them overnight. So they'll basically be able to close down the restaurant and then prepare for, for opening operations. And so that's why we asked for the extended hours, 24 hours license. Um, uh, I, I don't know what other questions to answer, sorry. You don't have to answer any questions. Okay. It's great you're here, thank okay. you. Okay, thank you. Is there anyone else here to speak to this issue? Anyone? Anyone? Seeing none, we'll close the public hearing. Councilmember Rainville. Thank you, Madam Chair. I would like to, to move approval of this item. Item number two has been moved for approval. Further comments or questions? Seeing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? That item is approved. Thank you, ma'am, for being here today. On item number three, huge improv theater, 2728 Lindale, on sale wine with strong beer. Mr. Cervantes, welcome. Thank you, Chair Goodman and committee members. I am District Supervisor Max Cervantes, Licenses and Consumer Services. I'm presenting an application from Huge Improv Theater, doing business as Huge Improv Theater. The business address is 2728 Lindale Avenue South, located in Ward 10. The current license is a theater license. The applicant is requesting an on-sale wine with strong beer, limited entertainment license. Huge Improv Theater has operated in the Lynn Lake neighborhood since 2011 at a different address with an on-sale wine and strong beer license and theater license. They are moving to this new address in a renovated building, intending to continue providing live improv comedy shows with wine and beer concessions. The proposed hours of operation are 8 a.m. to 1 a.m. daily, uh, with classes during the day and shows starting at 6 p.m. and concluded by 1 a.m. The performances will be uh, 6 p.m. to 10 p.m. Sunday through Thursday, 6 p.m. to midnight, Friday and Saturday. They have indoor seating for 125. On November 6th, public hearing notices were sent to property owners within 600 feet of the premises. Notices were also sent to the Lowry Hill East Neighborhood Association, the Lynn Lake Business Association, the Lake Street Council, and Councilmember Member Chugtai. Uh, we have received six comments from the community, all in support of the license. The Licenses and Consumer Services Division recommends approval of an on-sale wine, strong beer, limited entertainment license for huge improv theater. This concludes my presentation at this time, and I'll stand for any comments or questions. Are there any questions for Mr. Cervantes on item number three? Seeing none, thank you for your report. We'll open the public hearing on item number three. Is there anyone here to speak to this issue? I see that Butch Roy is here. You're hard not to notice. <laughs> Thank you for being here. Thanks for having me. Uh, my name is Butch Roy. I'm the co-executive director of Huge Improv Theater. Uh, we're an artist-led nonprofit uh, performance space. We've been, uh, as Max, uh, Max really summed it up well, uh, we've been uh, operating in Lynn Lake for 13 years. Uh, we did, uh, at our peak, uh, a little more than 600 performances a year. Uh, we operated with our, our previous beer and wine license for 13 years without incident or complaint. Uh, and we're, we're really excited. Uh, earlier this year, we completed the purchase uh, of 2728 Lindale, and we're really excited to open our permanent home, uh, continue operating in Uptown. Um, and I, I'm happy to answer questions. Uh, I'm grateful for your time and uh, urge you to support the application. Thank you for being here today. Thanks very much. Is there anyone else here to speak to this issue? Anyone? Anyone? Seeing none, we'll close the public hearing. Councilmember Member Chugtai. Thank you, Madam Chair. I am so excited that HUGE is staying on Lindale. It's such an important part of the uptown fabric and community and I'm thrilled that they have found their permanent home and very excited to move this item for approval. Item number three has been moved for approval. Final comments or questions? Seeing none, all in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? That item is approved. We'll move on to item number four. Mr. Olson has that item. Uh, this is the Kenwood. Finally, on sale liquor. Oh, I mean, on sale liquor, of course. Uh, thank you, Chair Goodman and committee members. Uh, I'm Joseph Olson, Inspector for Business Licenses and Commu Consumer Services. Today, I'm presenting a license upgrade application from the restaurant The Kenwood owned by JD Restaurants, LLC. Uh, this business is located at 2115 21st Street West in Ward 7. Um, the Kenwood 
today is uh, applying to upgrade from an on-sale wine license with Sunday sales to an on-sale liquor license with Sunday sales. Pretty straightforward. Uh, the Kenwood will not make any other changes to their operation as part of this upgrade. Uh, notices were sent to property owners within 600 feet of the premises, and they were also sent to the Kenwood Neighborhood Association, Southwest Minneapolis Business Association, and Council Member Lisa Goodman. We have received five comments from the public regarding this application, all endorsing the license upgrade. And historically, there have been no complaints, 311 calls or police calls associated with this business. The license and consumer division recommends approval of on-sale liquor with Sunday sales. And this concludes my presentation. At this time, I will stand for any comments or questions. Thank you. Are there any questions for Mr. Olson? Seeing none, thank you for your report. We'll open the public hearing on item number four. And I know Joel is here. Oh, he's not. I thought he was here. Well, I'm going to go up here. You can speak first. <laughs> Hi there. My name is Rosemary Ewing, and I live around the corner from the Kenwood. And this establishment, establishment is phenomenal. It's the best food in town, I say. But more importantly, our neighborhood loves this restaurant, and it's it's perfect for the where we are. Um, this guy serves phenomenal food. It's a safe place. It's a professionally run place. Um, I just endorse this wholeheartedly, and I get a free bottle. Of <laughs> Thank you, Rosie. <laughs> Thank you for your testimony and for coming down today. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Joel DeBilson. I am the owner uh, and chef of the Kenwood Restaurant. Um, we are a seasonal Italian uh, restaurant. We extrude house-made pasta daily. Um, fell in love with Italian cuisine um, ever since I started cooking. So um, what I am here to ask for you guys is um, for us to be able to expand our beverage list and to um, provide um, an extensive list for us to be able to give the best hospitality that we can uh, within that business. So. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much for being here today. Is there anyone else here to speak to this issue? Anyone? Anyone? Seeing none, I'll close the public hearing. I'd like to move approval myself and tell a tiny story. When I first started on the city council, you couldn't even have a restaurant at this location. Um, we did not allow commercial operations like a restaurant in the zoning that was allowed. In, near, in the Kenwood neighborhood. And then the zoning changed and a restaurant came in, but they weren't allowed to have any liquor or wine or beer. And then we had a charter amendment that allowed us to have wine and beer in neighborhood restaurants, and the restaurant got beer, and now they're getting liquor as well. It says something about how people's um, opinion about what it would be like to live right next door to or around the corner from a neighborhood, a small neighborhood business that couldn't even be a restaurant that's now is a restaurant that that's evolved into having a full menu like any other restaurant. It uh, really says something about how the community has changed and how laws can be changed in order to foster really very localized neighborhood development. I'm really proud of you guys. You uh, purchased the restaurant a few years back, uh, survived the pandemic, kept it going, and that's because all of the Seventh Ward really supports what you're doing. I'm really happy you're gonna move towards liquor. Um, I'm sure it'll be better when I have my egg on top of my hamburger, which is a... <laughs> <laughs> really bad thing, <laughs> but still love it. So thank you for all you're doing. Um, on the chair's motion to approve, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? That item is approved. We'll move on to item number five. Ms. Lingo, welcome. Thank you, Chair Goodman and committee members. I'm Amy Lingo, manager for um, licenses and consumer services. The uh, I am presenting an application from GIA, owned by GIA LLC. The business is located at 5555 Xerxes Avenue South in Ward 13. The applicant requests an on-sale liquor with no live entertainment. There will be 75 seats on the interior, 24 seats on the exterior on a private patio. GIA will include a full service restaurant model and they plan to sell a full menu of rustic Italian cuisine and a full bar serving wine, beer, and full spirits. The proposed hours of operation, interior, Tuesday through Saturday, 4 p.m. to 10 p.m. The exterior, Tuesday through Saturday, 4 p.m. to 9 p.m. 81 notices were sent to property owners within 600 feet. They were also sent to the Armitage Neighborhood Association, the Southwest Minneapolis Business Association, and Councilmember Linnea Palmazano. 
We have received two responses from the community, one of which is in complete support of the license and the other has some concerns about parking. There are no operating conditions on or other issues and the Licenses and Consumer Services Division recommends approval for the on-sale liquor with no live entertainment license. This concludes my presentations and at this time I stand for any comments or questions. Are there any questions for Ms. Lingo on item number five? Seeing none, thank you for your report. We'll open the public hearing on item number five. It looks like Joe and Lisa are here and I would invite you to speak at this time. Hi, thank you for having me. I'm Joe Seddon. I'm here talking on behalf of myself and Lisa, who's in the corner there. Uh, we're very excited to have recently acquired the lease of the restaurant that was Carve Van Restaurant next to Pizza Lola in southwest Minneapolis. Um, and it's been our long uh, dream to open an Italian restaurant and we've been searching for the right space. Uh, it's a space that we know well. We uh, have done some pop-ups there which have been widely re well received by the local community. Um, and really our intention is to create a neighborhood restaurant that serves the community, that is what the people want to have in that space, that's sort of a casual fine dining uh, restaurant. And to that end, uh, we are looking for a license which includes wine, but also a liquor license, um, as you heard from our colleague over there, so that we can also provide what the sort of the, the neighborhoods now want in their spaces, a short cocktail menu and uh, a wine list. Thank you. Fantastic, thank you so much for being here today. Is there anyone else here who would like to speak to this issue? Anyone? Seeing none, we'll close the public hearing. Council Member Rainville. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, it would be my uh, pleasure to approve item number five. Item number five has been moved. Further comments or questions? Seeing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. Uh, aye. Any opposed? That item is approved. We'll move on to item number six, Berlin. Ms. Harvett, welcome. Thank you, Chair Goodman and committee members. I am Lead Inspector Michelle Harbutt from Licenses and Consumer Services. I'm presenting an application from Berlin Music Bar LLC, doing business as Berlin. They will be located at 204 North 1st Street in Ward 3. The applicant is requesting approval of an on-sale liquor with Sunday sales, general entertainment license, and a sidewalk cafe license. If approved, they intend to operate a full service restaurant and provide live jazz music with patron dancing sometime in the future. They are proposing to have 74 interior seats and eight seats on the sidewalk cafe that faces First Street. The establishment will be located at street level in the historic former Hot Hennepin Hotel building. Proposed hours of operation are Wednesday through Monday, 4 p.m. to 1 a.m. on the interior and same time or same days except ending at 12 a.m. on the exterior. On November 9th, 126 notices were mailed to property owners within 450 feet of the establishment and notices were also emailed to the North Loop Neighborhood Association, the Warehouse District Business Association and Council Member Rainville. Notices were posted at Berlin and the surrounding multi-residential buildings. We have received no comments from the community about this application. The Licenses and Consumer Services Division recommends approval for an on-sale liquor with Sunday sales, general entertainment license, and sidewalk cafe license for Berlin. This concludes my presentation. I'm standing by for any questions. Thank you, Ms. Harvett. Uh, Council Member Rainville. Thank you, Madam Chair. First, uh, Ms. Harvett, thank you so much for all the excellent work you do in that North Loop and downtown area. It's uh, it's a hotbed of entertainment and it needs guardrails and you're in charge of those guardrails and you're doing a great job. So thank you very much. Uh, and you've done a great due diligence uh, for this North Loop, but I did get a request from the North Loop Neighborhood Association if the owners of Berlin could contact them and, and uh, appear before them. Uh, so could you please pass that message on? through the chair, um, Council Member Rainville. Yes, of course, I'll pass that message on. I did see that a notification was made by email that mm -hmm. maybe something was overlooked. No, no, they are aware of it, but they would like to uh, meet personally with the owners and, and talk to them. So if you could do that, I'd appreciate it. Thank through you. Through the chair, yes, sir. Thank you, Council Member Rainville. Looks like the owner might be here, um, Maggie Strom. And then uh, John Kerr are also welcome to speak. I'm going to open the public hearing. Maybe we'll just start with that. Have you had an opportunity to speak to the North Loop Neighborhood Association? I've sent them an email, but 
but I'll need, sounds like I need to meet with them directly. I, I mean, the fact that we'd have no comments probably says not a lot of people knew about it. Um, so that'd be good. To be clear, I am not the owner. Oh, I'm, okay. I'm representing the owner. I'm uh, a hospitality consultant. Oh, okay. Who is the owner? Rich Henriksen. Okay. He owns the building as well. Okay, great. Go ahead, ma'am. Good afternoon, Chair Goodman and committee members. I'm Maggie Strom, and I'm here on behalf of Berlin. Berlin will be a live music venue and listening lounge, as well as a full restaurant and bar, opening in early 2024 in the North Loop at 204 North First Street. We will offer intimate cabaret-style seating with approximately 20, 80 seats in total. If granted a license, we plan to be open six days a week, closed on Tuesdays. Berlin will be a positive asset to our city and neighborhood. With intention, we plan to support hospitality professionals by supporting employment with a safe, thoughtful workplace culture, as well as development and growth opportunities for a team as our company can span, expands. Lastly, um, we also will be a positive asset to the city because we will be supporting local and regional artists and musicians, providing them a healthy pay structure, as well as a platform for them to share their work with our community. Thanks for your time and consideration. Do you have any questions? Councilmember Rainville. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, Ms. Strom. If, again, if you could just pass on to uh, Rich, if he could contact uh, the North Loop and make some time for them. The North Loop Neighborhood, Neighborhood Association. Neighborhood Association, yes. No problem. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I also have John Kerr on the agenda. Welcome. You have two minutes, sir. Thank you. Uh, so my name is John Kerr. I'm a resident of the 212 Lofts, which is right next door to the proposed location. My primary comment and concern is around the operating hours, uh, being a little bit later than the hours of the other restaurants in the neighborhood, uh, especially the exterior hours. Uh, to be honest, my bedroom is only a few feet from where those uh, chairs will be. I have no fundamental concern with the overall. Um, however, uh, I do just have concerns with the midnight uh, hours and the 1 a.m. hours, and just wanted to have those noted in the overall notes. Uh, thank you so much for your testimony. You. We'll just first see if there's anyone else here to speak, and then we'll call on Councilmember Rainville. Is there anyone else here to speak to this issue? Anyone? Seeing none, we'll close the public hearing. Councilmember Rainville. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. Kerr, I, I uh, hear you loud and clear, and uh, this is a, a, a residential neighborhood that's turning into an entertainment district right before our very eyes. And so, again, I would just encourage, uh, have you had any contact uh, with the owner at all? I haven't had any contact. I'm not aware of anybody in the building who has had contact. Okay. So, uh, Ms. Strom, are you still in the, yep. in the room? Oh, there you go. So I have another ask of you. Uh, could you please facilitate a meeting with the 212 lofts uh, and, and the owner to, to talk through these issues? And, and ju just know I'm on the side of the residents if push comes to shove. Absolutely. Thank you. Council Member Anvil, I think the best thing to do would be to move this forward without recommendation so that we know that they're able to meet with the North Loop neighborhood as well as um, the residents. I'll note that the last council meeting of the year is the 7th of December. So if it doesn't get resolved by the 7th, it'll, there'll be a wait till j about end of January. So this is something that probably should happen quickly. And I'll note to the residents, you don't have the power to tell them they can't do it. <laughs> so, um, but it would make sense. They could reassure you of what their business plan is as well. And uh, hopefully they can do that, Council Member Rainville, uh, by the 7th of December, which is a week from Thursday. Is that satisfactory to you? Yes. Uh, on the motion to move it forward without recommendation, all in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? That item has been moved forward. I will move on to item number seven, uh, which is um, business license operating conditions at BINA. I don't know who has this. Uh, Mr. Mohammed, welcome. Thank you, Chair Goodman and committee members. I am Licensed Inspector Akbar Mohammed, Licenses and Consumer Services. I'm presenting the application from the Quincy Northeast LLC doing business as Bina's, located at 1404 Quincy Street Northeast in Ward 1. Bina's plans to have a vibe of a Northeast dive bar with fresh, youthful, youthful and refined twists. Bina's will capture warm en energy through thoughtful design in hopes to, to create a casual dining experience. The food is simple, 
burger and fries. The proposed hours of operation are for the interior, Sunday through Saturday, 8 a.m. to 1 a.m. They have exterior seating for 96 patrons and no exterior seating. On November 7th, 87 public hearing notices were sent to property owners within 600 feet of the premises. Notices were also sent to Logan Park Hills Neighborhood Association, the Northeast Chamber of Commerce Business Association, and Council, Mem and Council Member Elliot Payne. Initially, a condition was requested to pre-approve this. However, there is no longer required because it's gone through police licensing approval process. The Licensing and Consumer Services Division recommends approval of an on-sale liquor, no entertainment, with Sunday sale, with no conditions. This concludes my presentation. At this time, I will stand for comments or questions. Are there any questions for Mr. Muhammad on this item? Seeing none, thank you so much for your report. We'll open the public hearing on item number seven, which is uh, business license operating conditions for BINAs. And I see there are two people signed up to speak, Andy and Jamie. You must be Jamie. I don't know who Andy is. But Andy, um, there is someone here. Andy Rank. Yes, yes there is someone here. Oh, so Andy. go ahead, ma'am. You can speak first. You have Hi, two minutes. I'm Jamie Olson. I am owner, uh, CEO of Central Restaurant Group. Um, we own the Centros uh, in Minneapolis, St. Paul. Uh, Centro in Northeast is the building that this new concept, Bina's, is directly connected to. Uh, so the space became available and we jumped on it because we uh, love the neighborhood and um, we're really excited for this new opportunity. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you for being here today. Um, we'll invite Andy to come up. You have two minutes, sir. Please state your name and address for the record. Sure, yeah, my name is Andy Rank. I'm at 1403 Monroe Street. So I'm a neighbor uh, right behind Centro and potentially Binaz. Um, I'm here on behalf of several neighbors who could not be here. Um, I don't think Ms. Olson knows me, but she's probably gotten several emails from my wife and many of my neighbors. Um, and I have nothing against her personally. I certainly uh, you know, appreciate that. It sounds like her company's doing great. I look forward to her growth. However, the, the big concern from, uh, from, from us as neighbors is ever since Sensor moved in, they put in a garage door in our alleyway, and that is where they pick up their garbage and recycling. Uh, and again, Ms. Olson is very familiar with these issues. I do believe she has tried in good faith to um, improve upon these issues, but uh, the, the company that picks up their recycling um, drops and, and breaks bottles and glass all of the time. I mean, it's, it's weekly, if not more than once a week. Um, this, they usually come very early in the morning. Uh, sometimes their hours change, um, but it's, we drive our cars over it. We have several neighbors that have busted tires from this glass. Um, we have children that come back there. My, I have two little kids, seven and four, that go back there and they play. Um, and you know, we've never had a problem with city pickup with any of our neighbors um, until Centro has moved in. And so if they're adding one more restaurant, it's just gonna be more garbage and recycling. Um, I don't, the problem is they don't have any business back in our alley. They don't have customers there, they don't have parking, they don't have staff back there, but we do live there and we use the alleyway to, for our cars and for our children to play in. And so um, it is a real issue and we're very worried about it. The best thing I wish that she would do is have their garbage collectors just pick up in their parking lot instead of in our alleyway because then if they break the glass, it's not our problem, it's their problem and they, they have to pick up the glass anyway, their staff does, but I don't know if they don't know when the, you know, the recycling people are coming. Uh, sometimes they don't have staff you know, even there when they're coming early in the morning. So this is a huge concern, and I wish that there were other ways that, that it could be addressed. Okay, thank you so much for your comments. We'll see if there's anyone else here to speak to this issue. Seeing none, we're going to close the public hearing. Ms. Lingo. Do you want me to condition the garbage pickup to be picked up in the alley? Or do you think this is something that can be handled at the staff level? I think this is something that can be handled at the staff level. And if it isn't, then we can move into conditions. Um, we will look into the concerns and work with the company. OK, but the expectation is that the garbage will not be picked up in the alley. I I'll have to look at the situation to see if that is a, an expectation that we can meet. But we can work on the expectation of sound and cleanliness at a bare minimum. How? 
like how? We can't even get people to pick up garbage some days. How are we going to work on that? We will need to, I will need to talk to the company to find out what their parameters are as well as work with Vina themselves to find out what the situation is. I don't want to promise that I can move them from the alley until I look at the situation um, in depth, but we will address the situation and find a way to make it beneficial for the neighborhood. Okay. Um, I'm going to move this forward then without recommendation because I haven't had an opportunity to talk to Councilmember Payne about it, but I lived in a building that had a bar on the first floor and we loved it, but it was like being woken up to some horrible situation with the bottles crashing in the middle of the night and the glass everywhere. And I can relate, but I loved having living above the bar. So I, there's a mixture of things here. So I think it's something that could be resolved by staff very quickly and then we can move it forward on the 7th, but I don't feel comfortable recommending it until um, I know it's something that can be collaboratively resolved, which I think makes the most sense. Council Member Rainville. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I just want to chime in on this too. I, I wish you the best success with your restaurant, but you as a, as a resident, uh, I, I really hear you loud and clear. And I'm, I'm hoping that we can come to some type of resolution uh, prior before this uh, vote comes before us. It's important that you both succeed and whatever you can do to, uh, personally I think if you just move your recycle away from the alley, that would, that would be a really good faith effort. But I'll leave uh, Ms. Lingo to manage this, but I, I want you both to succeed. Thank you. So to be clear, I don't want to push this into January. So um, I'm asking staff to work with the business so we can get this approved on the 7th. I see the neighbors saying, yes, they agree with that. So let's see if we can get some conversation going before now and the 6th, which is when we would really need to know about this. Um, so I'm, the motion is to move it forward without recommendation. All, any further comments or questions? Seeing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? That item is approved. We'll move on to public hearing. Item Item number eight, uh, which is the 3030 Nicolet Project Tax Increment Financing District. Um, Mr. Schumacher, welcome. Thank you, uh, Chair Goodman and BIS committee members. I'm Dan Lauer Schumacher. I'm a senior project coordinator with the residential finance team at CPED. Today I'll be presenting staff recommendations on 3030 Nicolet, which is a mixed use development in the Lindale neighborhood in Ward 8 in the former Wells Fargo site. Uh, this project has been before the committee a number of times, including the approval of the affordable housing trust funds, passed through grants uh, from the city's funding partners and a preliminary housing revenue bond approval just this past June. Um, before describing these act or action items, I will provide the committee with a brief overview of the project. Uh, the project includes 109 affordable housing units with one market rate unit for a caretaker in a six story building. Uh, 12 units are affordable at 30% AMI and are, and are efficiency units with housing support for individuals experiencing homelessness. Uh, and 97 units are 50% AMI with a range of studios, one, two, three, and four bedroom units. Uh, PPL has secured 12 project-based vouchers for large families in two, three, and four bedroom units. Uh, there are two commercial components on the first floor. One part will be rented to Wells Fargo as a new branch on the site, and the second part includes four commercial condos, uh, which will be purchased by small businesses. The total cost for this project uh, is approximately $54.7 million. Uh, this project will be structured with a first mortgage uh, financed by Wells Fargo and supported with housing revenue bonds and tax increment financing. The housing revenue bonds will also bring 4% housing tax credit equity to the project allocated by the city. Developer participation includes $1 million in deferred developer fee and a loan from PPL in the amount of $3.7 million. The first set of action items on today's agenda is related to the proposed tax increment financing. The developer has requested a pay-as-you-go TIF assistance from the city to help pay for eligible construction costs. The 3030 Nicollet TIF plan establishes a new housing TIF district. The tax increment financing plan attached to the report provides a detailed breakdown of how the increment financing will be distributed and used. Pending city council approval, the city of Minneapolis will issue a pay-as-you-go tax increment note in the amount of $534,700 to this project. The 3030 Nicollet 
tax increment financing plan was transmitted to the required uh, for the required 45-day review to Hennepin County, the Minneapolis School Board, and the City Planning Commission, and other interested parties on October 12th in 2023. One public comment was received about the plan in support of the establishment of the district. The second set of actions before you today is request for contingency funding from the Affordable Housing Trust Fund. Like many other city projects, 3030 Nicollet has been challenged with increased costs due to rising interest rates and construction costs. The developer is now requests 1.65 million in contingency funds to help close that final funding gap. The final request action today, or the final request for action today is the bond request. As mentioned earlier, the developer received a preliminary approval for the housing revenue bonds in June and are now back to request are requesting the issuance of up to 26.5 million in housing revenue bonds on behalf of this project. The bonds will be issued in one or more series and will be used to finance the construction and or long-term debt. The bonds will generate approximately 22 million in 4% tax equity. Staff is recommending the approval of the TIF plan, the Affordable Housing Trust Fund, or Affordable Housing Trust Fund contingency funds, and housing revenue bond request. These approvals will position the project to close in the first quarter of 2024. With that, I am happy to take any questions the committee may have. Uh, thank you, sir, for that presentation. Are there any questions for the staff? Uh, no question, and I'm happy to move that um, item, item eight, for approval. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Excuse aye. me. Um, public. Public. We haven't opened the public hearing. Yes. Yes. <laughs> okay. I'm happy to open public hearing. Are there any? All right. No one is here to speak. All right. Um, I'm here to close public hearing, and no question. All those favor say aye. 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 All those, okay, the item passed. We'll move to item number nine. Um, interim use um, on behalf of the wall companies presented by Aaron Hanor. All right, good afternoon, council members. In 2020, the Malcolm Yards development received approvals for a planning development with a food hall and two residential buildings with over 330 residential units. Area highlighted, let's see here. Um, in January of 2021, the applicant received approvals for a three-year interim use permit for a 112-space surface parking lot that being highlighted in that area shown in red to serve the food hall and the construction workers for the two apartment buildings. Those approvals for the surface parking lot expire in January 2024. The applicant is seeking a two-year extension of the interim use permit for the parking lot to go to January 2026. But in the upcoming months, we should expect the applicant to come forward for city entitlements for a permanent parking lot in the same location. But a little more time was needed to prepare final details. CPED's recommending approval of this interim use permit for two years. And I know the applicant, John Wall, here is here on behalf of the development team to answer any questions you may have, but does not have a prepared presentation. It um, doesn't have a formal presentation for you today. So I'm happy to answer questions as well. Are there any questions for Mr. Hanauer? Seeing none, uh, thank you so much for your briefing. I will open the public hearing on item number nine. Uh, this is a very simple extension of an interim use permit. Does anyone feel the need to speak on this? Seeing none, I'm going to close the public hearing and move approval. All in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? That item has been approved. We will now move on to item number 10. Uh, Ms. Weckworth, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wall. Ms. Lansing, thank you very much for being here. Um, are you ready? Yes. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Goodman and committee members. I'm Cindy Weckworth. I'm the Director of Environmental Health in, from the Health Department. Today I'm presenting ordinance amendments to Title 13 
Chapter 339, Body Art Code. This Body Art Code was first established in 2001, and the amendments before you are authored by Chair Goodman. The amendments to the regulation clean up the definitions and allow for more temporary tattoo and piercing events than is currently allowed. Um, we, the um, goal was to eliminate some of the redundancy. You can see that um, both the definition of establishment and, and temporary body art establishment have been stricken from the um, ordinance and are incorporated into the general definition of body art establishment. And we've also removed the de definition of convention temporary event and guest artist temporary event and incorporated that into section 120, which is the um, temporary event license section. In this section, we also combined the duration and the number of the events. So the current body art code allows a, less, a licensed body art establishment to host two events per year for a maximum of seven consecutive days. And if approved, the amendment would allow up to 10 events per year for a maximum of 21 days in the year. It also allows for individuals who are not um, a licensee of a Minneapolis body art establishment to hold up to four events a year for a maximum of 10 days total. Uh, the 69 licensed body art establishments were notified of the public hearing. And I thank you and stand for any questions. Are there any questions for staff on this item? Seeing none, thank you so much for your report. Are there any, is there anyone signed up to speak to this issue? Okay, um, just because my dad's in the audience, I want to note that this is not something I brought forward, but something that <laughs> staff brought forward and asked me if I would author. I, I saw his face as soon as you said that, and I thought, oh, gosh, he lives in Chicago. We'll never see what I'm doing now he's seeing it, so that's pretty funny. <laughs> we'll go ahead and open the public hearing on item number 10. Uh, which is essentially allowing more one-time events, pop-up events for people who are involved with body art and piercing and that kind of thing. It does happen at brew pubs and those kinds of places, and we want to be really sensitive to that. Is there anyone else here to speak to this issue? Anyone? Anyone? And maybe I should add for your father's benefit that former council member Johnson brought this forward and you helped out. Yeah, well. exactly. You're clear. Thank you. <laughs> Councilmember Ellison. Oh, I was. Have you moved it yet? I have not, and okay, I. But I um, am closing the public hearing. Oh, got it. I was just going to say, I'm happy if if the public clear, hearing is closed. It is, sir. Happy to move approval, <laughs> and uh, and we totally plan on getting matching tattoos. Yeah. So <laughs> just want to let your dad know that. Um, no, but happy to move approval. Thank you. <laughs> on the motion to approve, uh, I want to thank Cindy Weckworth. You know, I don't get a lot of chances to work with you guys, but you're just fantastic. So thank you so much for your hard work. On the motion to approve, all in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? That item is approved. And now, Ms. Lingo, you have been here for, oh, no, not Ms. Lingo. Mr. Cervantes, Pedicab Ordinance Operations and Vehicle Standards. Good afternoon, Chair Goodman and committee members. I am Max Cervantes, District Supervisor for Licenses and Consumer Services. I'm presenting an ordinance amendment relating to Title 13, Licenses and Business Regulations, amending Chapter 305, Pedicabs. Pedicabs have existed in Minneapolis since 1984. However, the appetite for this mode of transportation did not begin uh, to reach its full popularity until 2010 with the opening of the Twin Stadium. At that time, Minneapolis jumped from one licensed pedicab to 41. The last time Chapter 305 was updated was in 2022 in response to companies' requests for modernization of the code to allow for the addition of an e-assist to the pedicab vehicles to make transporting passengers easier. This year, an owner of a small pedicab company uh, reached out and requested a change to the code to allow for pedicab trailers to be used outside of prearranged rides. Currently, trailers Trailer use is restricted to prearranged rides only. One, only one trailer may be attached to a pedicab. Additionally, a different pedicab operator requested a change to the code to allow for the definition of a pedicab to be changed to allow for a model of pedicab that has two bench seats uh, to be used. This model did not meet the definitions uh, of a pedicab due to the dimensions and was um, two inches too long. 
If the amendment is approved, this model of pedicab would be allowed. Outreach included public hearing notice distribution on November 15th of 68 notices to all licensed pedicab businesses and drivers, all Minneapolis business associations, all Minneapolis neighborhood associations, and all, all Minneapolis council members. Uh, with the proposed ordinance amendment, uh, what the proposed ordinance amendment intends to do with the update of chapter 305 is to modernize the pedicab code to create an opportunity for more passengers to be conveyed by safe and green transportation services. This concludes my presentation. At this time, I will stand for any comments or questions you may have. Thank you. Are there any questions for Mr. Cervantes? Seeing none, thank you for your report. We'll open up the public hearing. I know Mr. McCarthy is here. Did you want to speak? Very briefly, yes. You can, sir, of course. We've only worked with you for like 20 years, so. Good afternoon. <laughs> My name is Stephen McCarty. I'm here to represent Twin Town Pedicabs. Uh, Twin Town Pedicabs is in favor, in favor of this ordinance modification. I believe that with these changes, our industry can better serve the public. We'll be able to transport significantly more passengers and in a safe and efficient manner. Currently, it is difficult, if not impossible, for a pedicab driver to serve a, to serve a group of four people who would otherwise wish to ride in a pedicab in Minneapolis. If two couples are visiting downtown, it's very difficult for us to serve them. This ordinance change will allow for us to do so, again, in a safe and efficient manner. By being able to accommodate more passengers, our drivers are also likely to earn more money during each shift that they work. We have operated our pedicabs with trailers regularly in multiple jurisdictions for over eight years. We've never had an issue of any kind with them. When we have operated our pedicabs with trailers in Minneapolis over the past eight years, they've been very well received by the public and their operation has been trouble free. We have always taken great pride in the safe operation of our pedicab fleet. In regard to the two inch extension of length, we don't oppose that. That change is specific to a new model pedicab recently introduced to the market by the leading domestic manufacturer of pedicabs. Twin Town Pedicabs does not own any of these longer pedicabs, but I have personally seen these longer units in operation. Actually, I've, I've ridden them as well, and I believe they would not be a problem of any kind in our city. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Thank you so much. Is there anyone else who would like to speak to this issue? Seeing none, I'll close the public hearing. Council Member Rainville. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I, I will be uh, moving approval of item number 11, but Mr. McCarthy, I, I want to thank you for coming down today. And I've enjoyed your service many times. I've found your drivers to be very professional. Your equipment is clean. And I, I am a firm believer that as we grow the entertainment aspect of our city, especially in downtown, that you have a, a big place in this. So thank you for uh, believing in our city. On Council Member Rainville's motion, further comments or questions? Seeing none, all in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? That item is approved. Thank you for being here today. We'll then move on to our quasi-judicial portion of the public hearing, and this includes two items. Item number 12, which is a variance appeal um, for a property at 5413 Woodlawn Boulevard. Mr. Ellis, welcome. Or at Mr. Quahouse, welcome. Thank you, Council Member Goodman and members of the committee. Before you today is an appeal of decisions of the Zoning Board of Adjustment denying variances to reduce the minimum required front and interior side yard setbacks for uh, construction of a proposed single family dwelling on an existing foundation at 5413 Woodlawn Boulevard. Uh, the appellants are the property owners, Patrick and Lana Skayan, who were the applicants for the variances and they are represented by Mark Thiroff today. Uh, this property is near Lake Nokomis. It has a lot area of just over 8,200 square feet, and the previous conditions include a one-story single-family dwelling, which you can see here. This house was substantially damaged by a fire in September of 2022 and was completely removed by the property owners with only the foundation and main-level floor trusses remaining. The proposal is to construct a new two-story single-family dwelling, and this would have the same footprint as the uh, previous dwelling. They are proposing to reuse the existing foundation and uh, main-level floor trusses, uh, but there is the new second story that would be uh, added on top of the new first story, and they are also proposing a number of changes to the uh, main-level exterior window and door arrangements. Here are some floor plans for the proposed structure. 
Uh, the variances that are required are to reduce the minimum required front yard, which uh, is based on the line drawn between the fronts of the neighboring houses. That's the dashed line you can see drawn across here. Uh, it's effectively a minimum front setback of 52 feet, and they are proposing to reduce that to 50.6 feet for using the existing foundation. And on the uh, northeast interior side yard, which is towards the top, it's a minimum setback of five feet, and they're proposing to reduce that to 4.2 for uh, use of the existing foundation. Uh, the staff recommendation was for denial in this case. As the members of the committee are aware, there are typically three required findings that need to be considered for variances. In this case, this property is in the Shoreland Overlay District, so there are some additional required findings specific to that overlay district. Uh, and you can see here for staff findings, we did find that uh, several of these were satisfied by this proposal, but there are uh, a couple of findings that staff found were not satisfied. Uh, for each variance request. So I will just go through those briefly, and um, it's substantially the same findings for both uh, variances as far as staff are concerned. Um, so the findings being uh, challenges in complying with the ordinance due to circumstances unique to the property, and uh, the reasonable use of the property in spirit and intent of the code. Uh, staff finds that these are not met, and these relate to that existing structure, the old one-story uh, dwelling being non-conforming, and uh, sustaining this fire damage. And the zoning code has language about non-conforming structures that sustain damage. Uh, and the zoning code would allow them to reconstruct that essentially in kind with some limited changes, but there are limitations in the zoning code for how many changes you can make to the design before it is treated as new construction and, um, and non-conforming rights are lost. So the changes to the design are really what is creating the need for the variance in this case and they are exceeding these specific thresholds in the zoning code, so we find that that would not be uh, following the, the spirit and intent of the code uh, in that regard. Uh, the Board of Adjustment hearing, it did include some discussion uh, among the members of the board and, um, and uh, now the appellants for other factors that were potentially considered, uh, and I would uh, presume the, the appellants will be speaking to that. Uh, but ultimately, the board voted three to one to deny these variance requests and adopting staff findings and recommendation in doing so. One other thing I just want to touch on briefly, there is a, a portion of the staff report where uh, we mentioned um, city council statements about uh, the use of an existing foundation for consideration of uh, practical difficulties for, uh, for reusing an existing foundation. Just wanted to clarify that that was um, intended to kind of reference what staff has heard in the past. For example, when past uh, proposals like this have come between before the old uh, Zoning and Planning Committee um, and was that was included in the staff report intended as kind of context for the rest of staff analysis for those findings. Um, but I do just want to clarify that um, our, our staff's understanding, the, an existing foundation can be considered in addition with other factors which may be identified for uh, satisfying those variance findings. So uh, just wanted to clarify that. Uh, I will also just note briefly, if the committee is inclined to grant this appeal, we would recommend three conditions of approval, which are pretty standard. First, that they receive their building permit application and site plan review approvals from city staff. Uh, two, that they receive, or that they complete construction within two years of today's date, unless extended by the zoning administrator. And three, that they provide and follow an erosion control plan demonstrating best management practices because they're in that shoreland overlay district. There were a number of public comments, all in favor. Um, the appellants and the representative are in attendance today. This concludes my presentation, but I'll stand for questions. Thank you for your presentation. So I just want to make sure I completely understand it and want to put it into like really simple terms. They had a house. There was a fire. They have nothing left but the foundation. We're telling them they can't build a house on the foundation because it's two stories instead of one because it's not similar to what was there before. And we would prefer that they build a new foundation eight inches wider and, or shorter in one location if they want to go up two stories. That's the kind of conundrum we're in, correct? Uh, Chair Goodman, that's correct in terms of what the zoning code allows and when we need to consider these findings for variances, that is staff's position. So their only choice would be to build a one-story house on the existing foundation, probably much more environmentally sustainable, or they can 
do a whole new foundation to build a two-story house, but we're, we're promoting density, but not really. We don't really want them to build more because the code won't allow them to do that. They have to build the same one-story house on the same foundation. That's right. Correct. Those are virtually two broad options where they could either rebuild what they had with some more limited changes, or they could move the house to be further from the front and side property lines. By like right. less than a foot. Correct. In both cases. In the front, front I think it's about one and a half feet. Right. Okay. Just want to make sure I understand, everyone understands the volume of change we're talking about. Thank you so much. Other questions for staff? Seeing none, thank you for your report. Um, we're going to invite Mr. Thiroff, I hope I said your name correctly, uh, forward. We are on kind of a ticking timeline here for the end of this meeting. So I'm hoping you can do your presentation. Do you think you can do it in five minutes? Less. Great. Go ahead, sir. I, I was planning to, to, to tell you that I, I know how long your agenda is. You've got a lot of stuff left. I do have some prepared comments, but I'd far prefer to address any questions or concerns you might have so that I get you the information that you need uh, to make this decision. Um, one thing I would s start off with is that it, responding to your question about what exactly is this, one additional thing to point out is that this proposed house is fully compliant with the zoning ordinance other than these two tiny little setback issues. There's a lot of information in the staff report about design changes, but none of those design changes are material for what we have to do today because they're all compliant with the zoning ordinance. Uh, I'd also point out we s cited a case from just a couple of months ago in our appeal uh, involving a uh, house that was non-compliant as to setbacks that came in and asked for greater setbacks than what we're asking for um, in a project that involved connecting a house and a garage, which was, again, a design choice. And there wasn't any suggestion from staff that, um, well, that's a, a, a variance they could avoid if they would just make different design decisions. Well, in the same way that it was seen as a reasonable use of this property to connect the house and the garage on that property, building a fully compliant two-story house uh, on this property is fully, com you know, is, is, is reasonable as well. Um, I think we've actually hit what we need to hit. Okay, um, we got it. Let me see if there are any questions for the appellants from members of the committee. It does not sound like there are any questions. We'll see if there's anyone else here to speak to this issue. Thanks. Um, is there anyone else here to speak to this issue? Anyone? Anyone? Seeing none, we are going to close the public hearing. I'm going to move to grant the appeal. I want to say a few things about this. I think our staff goes out of their way to try to get to yes. So, and this is a group of people in our planning department who support density, building, and construction. So I just want to lay that out there. They are constrained by what the code says, uh, but genuinely, these are people who want to get to yes. And so I'm often very reluctant to go against what staff recommends. Um, but as I've told staff, I have a personal situation where I bought a house that was built on an existing foundation after a fire that is too close on a, I'm on a corner lot that was built too close to the side. So I can understand, I wasn't there when the house was built, but I can understand how frustrating it would be to have one and a half feet in one direction or one in another. Um, this seems to me to be within the spirit and intent of our comprehensive plan, which is to rebuild on an existing foundation and use an existing foundation. Um, so I do think it is reasonable in terms of use of spirit and intent. Um, I did have an opportunity to talk to Councilmember Koski. She also agrees uh, that this is something that we should um, seriously consider supporting the appeal. Uh, so we do have the support from the council member. I would also condition my support on the three findings, uh, well, on the recommendations of our staff with regard to the conditions as outlined by Mr. Coolhouse and ask staff to draft findings based on the spirit of our conversation. Are there further comments or questions on my motion? Seeing none, all in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? That item is approved. Thank you for your patience today. We'll move on to item number 13. Uh, Mr. Murphy, you've been here a long time, so thank you for your patience and your hard work. I, I feel guilty every time you have to come here and ask us to raise and remove a building, and we appreciate your hard work. Thank you. Appreciate that. Uh, Chair, Chair, <sighs> Councilmember Goodman and committee members, uh, good afternoon. My name is Wayne Murphy. I'm a lead inspector with Regulatory Services. Uh, I come before you today to consider adopting the recommendation of the Nuisance Condition Process Review Panel regarding the property at 3605 Columbus Avenue South. Uh, 3605 
Columbus Avenue South is fire damaged and poor condition, has multiple violations of the Minneapolis Housing Maintenance Code, and was referred to the vacant building registration on January 16th of 2016. Staff determined that the property was substandard, met the definition of a nuisance per Minneapolis Code of Ordinance Chapter 249, and was issued a director's order to demolish on August 11th of 2023. That order was appealed by the owner, m and Staffing LLC, on the grounds that they wished to rehabilitate the property. A hearing was held before the Nuisance Condition Process Review Panel on October 18th. The panel heard the matter, considered the owner's plan and financial ability, and recommended that the property be rehabilitated subject to conditions so that it no longer constitutes a nuisance. I stand for comments. Are there any comments or questions with regard to Mr. Murphy's presentation on the demolition at 3605 Columbus Avenue? Seeing no comments, we'll see if there's anyone here to speak to this issue. So this is a public hearing with regarding to raise and remove a building at 3605 Columbus. Is there anyone here to speak to this issue? Anyone? Anyone? Seeing none, I'll close the public hearing and move approval of the staff recommendation. Uh, comments or questions? All in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? That item is approved. We will now move into our discussion agenda. So we have a number of discussion items. We have approximately 28 minutes left. So I feel really bad because there are a lot of staff here for a lot of important issues. Um, I do see the trust fund and the tax credits as the first items on the agenda, and there's staff here on the Great Streets program as well. Um, and uh, a number of other issues. Do you, do you guys want to just do you want to move this one forward next or do you want us to wait? I'm not sure. I mean, I feel like someone at CPED should decide what makes the most sense. Oh, who's here from the public? Are there public members here on the trust fund items? The applicants okay. are here. Okay. Let's go ahead and do that then. So we are going to attempt in this meeting to get through the trust fund presentation and the 9% tax credit uh, preliminary reservation. And then we're going to have to postpone items 27 and 28 to tomorrow morning's agenda starting at 10:30, where there are already four items on the agenda so this these will be added to those items as well is every is everyone okay on the committee okay with that great thanks Ms. flack welcome and anyone who's sitting outside is welcome to come in as well good afternoon madam chair and members of the committee i'm carrie goldberg with cped residential finance and i'm pleased to present the recommendations for the 2023 affordable housing trust fund program the affordable housing trust fund program is the city's largest program that assists in financing the production and preservation of affordable and mixed income rental housing projects with 10 or more units and with at least 20 percent of the units affordable to households at or below 50 percent of the area median income the 2023 budget for this year is 16.8 million, and this year the city received 24 applications requesting just over 53.7 million. Staff is recommending nine projects for trust fund awards that total the 16.8 million. The trust fund notice of funding availability, also known as our NOFA, uh, contains the criteria established to assist staff in reviewing and evaluating and scoring applications. All applications were scored and ranked according to that selection criteria, but it's also important to note that scoring is only one component of the evaluation for award recommendations. Uh, there are instances where lower ranking applications may be recommended for funding over higher ranking applications based on project readiness, prior awards, or other committed funding to the project, along with other criteria that's identified in the NOFA. As part of the trust fund NOFA approval in the spring, the city council directed staff to analyze several proposed sc uh, scoring criteria. The proposed changes were to further increase available points for 30% AMI units, units with project-based rental assistance and homeless units beyond the amendments that were already being proposed by staff. In summary, the proposed scoring changes did not appear to enhance the program's ability to produce more deeply affordable and homeless units, and based on the other factors, staff would have still recommended the same projects being presented today. And there's an attachment in your report, uh, attachment four, that shows the analysis of those changes. The projects largely ranked the same with slight adjustments up or down for a handful of projects. 
Staff also analyzed the impact of the changes that were proposed in the NOFA as recommended by staff to increase the number of 30% AMI units and run assisted units to qualify for points, as well as increasing points for homeless units. These changes, along with several others, reflected success in increasing the number of units in those categories overall for the 2023 round of applications. And those numbers are also presented in your report. Before I highlight the projects being recommended today, I'd like to just point a couple successes that are also in your report in more detail. These are the result of priorities and policies that are included in the trust fund program. In order for uh, to be competitive for funding, projects must include deep affordability, support services, rental assistance, homelessness, larger units, and more. These are all goals that are incentivized in the scoring. 2023 project applications included units that address these goals and priorities at increased levels that we've never seen before, which we believe reflects the success of those incentives as well as the program overall. These next several slides are gonna highlight the projects that are being recommended today. The first is Cheatham Apartments. This will be a newly constructed building that integrates the adaptive reuse of the work housing building, a locally designated historic structure. This project preserves the elevator building, retains the silo foundations and the lower floor footprints and creates deeply affordable housing in a transit oriented development location in the Howe neighborhood. This project provides a large number of two and three bedroom deeply affordable housing units for families. The Northview project is a preservation project that involves the substantial rehabilitation of three properties for families exiting homelessness located in the Bryant and Powderhorn Park neighborhoods. They are Third Avenue townhomes, Cedarview, and North Haven. Supportive services are provided by Simpson Housing Services. The rehabilitation work will address critical physical needs for the property, such as repairing, replacing major building systems that are at the end of their useful life, as well as updating individual units. The LOMA is a low-income senior housing mixed-use project that includes a number of larger three-bedroom units in order to house multi-generational cultural households. The first floor commercial space will be anchored by a Liberian restaurant with additional commercial space prioritized and affordable to BIPOC business owners. Touchstone Mental Health will be providing support services on site. 1301 Lake Street is a 1.3 acre parcel of vacant land located one block off of Hennepin and Lake Street in the uptown neighborhood. The site is adjacent to Seven Points Mall, formerly known as Calhoun Square, and is a designated recovery site within two blocks of Lake Street. This affordable housing project includes 120 units within a six story building with 24 units restricted for homelessness with support services provided by Common Bond Communities Advantage Services. Service coordinators will engage residents on identifying the goals that they can work on to maintain stability and independence. The project includes engage, uh, many amenities with additional square footage to be programmed through a community engagement process that will drive the vision for the use of that space. Portland Village Rehab, this is a project that has been highly successful in its resident impact on housing stability. 75% of the current residents have been there over a year and the average length of residency is two and a half years. This stability and supportive services provided help residents increase household incomes over time. Hennepin County Continuum of Care recognized Portland Village for their work in helping residents maintain and increase their income. The rehabilitation work will address critical physical needs of the property, such as repairing and replacing major building systems that they are end of their useful life as well as updating individual units. Little Earth is a 212 unit apartment and townhouse community located in the East Phillips neighborhood and is the only indigenous preference project based section eight rental assistance community in the United States. This community has been continuously operated by a 100% native resident governing body and an executive team that is 75% native since 1983. The project is a substantial rehabilitation that includes making structural repairs to the townhomes to maintain long-term viability of the Little Earth community housing. The St. Olaf Exodus Building Project involves the rehabilitation and new construction of the Exodus Building. 
Originally constructed in 1956 for the Women's Christian Association, which was one of the city's first charitable organizations, this building and site location has historically offered housing, education, and training to women irrespective of age and color since 1866. Sold in 1992 to St. Olaf, it has been providing transitional housing operated and managed by Catholic Charities until they moved to their new facility in 2022. This project will provide 66 units of permanent supportive housing serving people experiencing homelessness, homelessness or at risk of homelessness. The Upper Harbor Terminal, Parcel 6A, is a new construction six-story, 178-unit apartment building and is the first phase on the Upper Harbor Terminal site. This project includes a significant number of deeply affordable housing units, 55 of which will have rental assistance and also 10 units reserved for homelessness. Support services are provided by the Minnesota Assistance Council for Veterans. This project will include approximately 9,300 square feet of commercial space and structured parking. These components will have separate financing and project owners from the apartment building but are all physically integrated into the larger Parcel 6A project. And last is NAC Housing. This is a new construction mixed-use project being co-developed and co-owned by the Native American Community Clinic and Wellington Management. The project will expand the NAC Clinic and provide deeply affordable large family units. The design team also includes Native American architect Sam Olbickson, owner of Full Circle Indigenous Planning and Design. The first two floors will be dedicated to NAC's clinic for medical and dental treatment, as well as space for mental and behavioral health services. Floors three through six will consist of the housing units, including amenities such as community rooms, a children's play area on the third floor roof deck, and a community plaza. Avivo will be providing support services for the project. In conclusion, I'll say that all applicants deserve a round of thanks for working so hard to submit these applications that incorporate so many city priorities for affordable housing in their development projects. Each year, the projects get stronger and stronger for our community. I'd also like to acknowledge the leadership and staff on our financial residence team for all the hard work and passion they have for the work we do. The application process is the first step to getting a project closed, constructed, and opened. Our team remains dedicated to these projects and the many challenges that are resolved to make them happen and they are a joy to work with. Lastly, on behalf of our team, I'd like to thank Councilmember Goodman for her many years of service to Minneapolis, as well as her leadership and devotion to affordable housing, of which without the Affordable Housing Trust Fund program would not exist, along with the tax credit program, I apologize. Um, you have championed these programs since their inception and has been a joy and privilege to work with you over these many years and celebrate the many successes. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer questions. And I also want to mention we invited the applicants today that they can be recognized. Thank you so much for your report and for this incredible work. I know that everyone who's listening to this sees just the volume of 30% units, units with vouchers, units with support services. I mean, it's really become the almost intense focus of our staff, especially larger units for families. And you can really see it panning out over time. It's very impressive. I know there are a number of people who are here today because of their projects. Maybe you could just stand up and introduce yourselves on behalf of your projects quickly. Like just say your organization's name and the name of the project. If you want to do that, you're welcome to do so. Uh, this would be the time. And you took all this time, everyone sat here two and a half hours. Victoria Yepes was a president of UI Management, and the project is the Loma. And I just want to say thank you all for the opportunity as I'm an emerging developer. And it's, it's, a, it's a beautiful thing to be able to build affordable housing in a neighborhood I once grew up in. Oh, yeah. that's great. Thank you. Hi, uh, Kevin Walker, Vice President of Housing Development at Beacon Interfaith Housing Collaborative. Uh, we propose the North View and greatly appreciate the city's support. We also saw the, the seismic shift that Council Member and, and Chair Goodman, you've referred to uh, the, the focus on 30% EMI supportive housing in particular and families and large units. These are all uh, near and dear to our hearts at Beacon, so we're really appreciative of the ways we've been able to engage the dialogue on that. Congratulations. So, thank you. Go ahead. Hi, Tom Strom, uh, United Properties, here representing our development team. Uh, our partner, Mr. Devin George, couldn't make it today, but uh, representing him as well. And so we're just thankful and excited to keep building on the momentum at Upper Harbor. Thank you. Hi, Stephanie Carp, project manager at Aon, representing the St. Olaf. 
project. <laughs> I'm very excited about this opportunity to advance this project forward. Thank you. Go ahead. Yes, my name is Renal Seert, and I'm the Executive Director at Little Earth of United Tribes Housing. I'm Tom LaSalle, LaSalle Group. We're working with them to, to get tax credits. And as you know, this contribution from the city is huge, huge. in getting the MHFA to select the project. So we thank you. Thank you. Casey. Uh, Casey Jovachensky at Wellington Management here with Cameron Olson from our team. Um, on behalf of the NAF Clinic and Housing Project, our uh, co-developers at NAF couldn't be here today because they're busy serving their patients. But we're very thankful. And thank you, staff, for all the work in the council. Thank you for being here. Hi, Elizabeth Flannery with Trellis. Uh, here on behalf of Chief of Apartments at 38th and Hiawatha. And again, just grateful to be here and thankful for the long-term partnership and support with the city and all the work that you're doing. Thank you. Go ahead. And Carly Smith from the studio of our student on behalf of the Portland Village Family Housing Project. Um, great project, we're very grateful. Thank you. It's terrific, thank you. Um, I have a quick question for staff, and that has to do with the rolling process for any remaining funds into next year. So there were probably 10 projects that were not funded. Um, could you just tell us how, what that process would look like? What if someone came in and met all the criteria January 27th? Right, so um, this year we actually expended the entire budget, so we don't have any funds that we can roll over um, via the pipeline process. Any of the existing projects that um, applied this year are considered eligible for the pipeline process should funds become available. Okay. Um, it is not unusual for projects to need to apply more than one time. Um, we encourage all applicants that didn't get selected this year to work with us. We, we have had great success in getting those applications strengthened um, and getting those funds, uh, projects awarded funds at a later date and time. Um, and I think that, um, you know, um, our dedication to that is, is speaks for itself, so. Yeah, it does, thank you. Are there other questions for staff? Would you like to move approval? I would love to move approval. Uh, and uh, thanks, staff, for all their work, and thank all the applicants. And, um, and uh, yeah, just uh, seeing, I know it's not in my ward, but I know that when the discussions around UHT, which could have been, were at times contentious, were coming up, the one thing that community wanted to see was the promise of housing and accessibility executed there. And so to see that phase one coming through, I think is really exciting, um, as well as all the other projects, not to, not to have the north side take up all the room in the air. I know there's a lot of really uh, important and valuable projects all over the south side as well. So thank you all for your work. And uh, yes, happy to move approval. Councilmember Rainville. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just want to uh, shout out to the staff. I, I see you out there in the audience, and you were very good about the briefing. I want to thank you again for answering all, all my questions. You know, I'm, I'm maybe I'm not a rookie anymore, but I, I have a lot to learn about housing. And uh, again, the staff has always been really good about answering all my questions, and I, I just thank you so much for that. Thank you, Councilmember Osman. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I do want to thank the staff too. Uh, this is our great project. It really makes me happy seeing NAC and Common Bond and um, you know other projects in, in in like Ward Six area and Ward Nine and Little Earth and so on. So uh, this goes a long way. And I'm looking at this, and it's large units too. That really makes me happy uh, seeing that. And yeah, I I would definitely. Um, uh, Thank the staff for kind of explaining to me too. Yesterday when I had a call, you know, I had a folks that called me and say, you know, they made it higher on the scoring, but we're not recommended. There's a lot of um, technical, and, and I'm happy that, you know, you kind of explain to them and follow up and just want to make that comment publicly that um, we're super happy the work you do. Thank you so much. Further comments or questions? Seeing none, all in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? That is approved, and then we'll move on to the 9% tax credit issue. I think we can get that one out, and then we will adjourn for the day. Thank you all for being here today, and congratulations. You're doing the work that we have so gratefully asked you to do. Ms. Carr. 
Uh, good afternoon, um, Chair Goodman, members of the committee. Um, I'm happy to be here. I'm Emily Carr. I'm a supervisor on the residential finance team, and I'm here today to present our annual 9% housing tax credit recommendations. Every year, CPED administers an allocation of 9% low-income housing tax credits, acting on behalf of the Minneapolis and St. Paul Housing Finance Board. The housing tax credit program provides a reduction in federal tax liability to investors in qualified low-income and affordable rental housing developments that comply with federally imposed rent and income restrictions for a minimum of 30 years. The City Council approved a two-year qualified allocation plan and procedural manual for this year's NOFA um, back in May. The QAP establishes the scoring and selection criteria for the tax credit program. The program timeline is similar to the trust fund and applications for this year's tax credits were due on July 20th. This year's CPED is administering an allocation of $1,468,310 in year 2024 9% housing tax credits. The city received three applications requesting a total of just over $7 million in tax credits. The summary list of projects, amount of tax credits requested, and unit breakdown is shown in the reports attached um, called 2024 Housing Tax Credit Application Summary. The applications were scored according to the scoring criteria established in the adopted Qualified Allocation Plan. Scoring for each of the projects is summarized in the attached 2024 Housing Tax Credit Scoring Summary. Based on staff scoring and review, staff is recommending that the highest scoring project, the St. Olaf Exodus Project, receive the full allocation of this year's um, $1,468,310 in tax credits. Though this allocation won't fulfill the project's request of $1.7 million in tax credits, it will position the project to feasibly be fully funded in next year's cycle. Carrie already highlighted this project in her Affordable Housing Trust Fund presentation, but just a bit more about its policy alignment with city goals. It's proposed by Aon. Um, the project will provide 66 units, affordable at 30% AMI or below. It includes the adaptive reuse of an existing downtown building. And half the units will come with housing support assistance and will be filled through coordinated entry and reserved for um, individuals experiencing homelessness. The other half of the units are proposed to be filled by referrals through Hennepin County's Behavioral Health Program. All services will be provided on site by Touchstone Mental Health a community-based nonprofit provider. Um, with that, I'd like to thank all the applicants for their hard work um, and commitment to providing affordable housing in our community. Um, that concludes my presentation, and I'm happy to stand for questions. I think Anne left. They won't. Oh, yeah, they're here. Oh, they're here. Okay. <laughs> um, and a representative from Anne is also here today. Are there any questions for Ms. Carr? Just wanted to make sure. Okay, it sounds like there's no questions. I'm going to move approval of the staff recommendation, not just because it's in my ward, um, <laughs> but because my ward is in enthusiastic and accepting of this kind of project that really gets at people who have lived in very precarious situations and will be housed as a result of the work that Aon is doing along with the support of all of the government agencies who are helping with this. This is an existing building. Many of you are for probably familiar with it. It is in between 2nd and 3rd on 9th Street. So it's right downtown, kitty corner from St. Olaf Church that's been a great partner with Aon. Um, in making this happen. Um, they had a much bigger vision and they probably would have done a lot more. Uh, but because there's so much competition, which is incredible, uh, to build up affordable housing, this is the part that we could get done now. I don't know of a lot of people who would say, put a 9% tax credit unit project with over 100 people next to me, um, but the neighborhood did. And the neighbors are very supportive. This is something that could really help us in our goals towards getting people from being unhoused into coordinated entry into a place where there are mental health supports and eventually able to live in affordable housing. It's exactly the kind of thing that everyone talks about wanting. I'm really thrilled that it's in my ward. I'm also very happy that it's downtown and want to thank our staff for all of the very hard work. I think this is the fourth go around. It's been at least four years uh, that this has been a dream for a number of people in the area. I'm glad that it ranked high enough to be supported this year. Further comments or questions? Councilmember Rainville. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Just a brief comment. I, I would, for the record, 
uh, a very strong advocate, very quiet behind the scenes, but very strong has been Father Kenny in this project. And while Father Kenny is not here tonight, I, I see some heads nodding back there. I just uh, feel it's very appropriate that he's recognized for his effort in this, and he never gave up, which is so important to get these tough projects done. So thank you, Father Kenny. On the motion to approve the tax credits, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? That item is approved. Uh, seeing lots of further business in front of us, but knowing we have the ability to reconvene at 10.30 tomorrow morning, I declare the meeting adjourned. Thank you. Sorry.